The desire to make one's death beautiful is in man's nature. For them, that was no longer a virtue, it was a way of life. Those were the words crossing through Ginkgo's mind when she defeated that samurai. Having no last words, the man declared that fighting and dying was enough for a samurai, and Ginkgo solemnly delivered the killing blow. As she cleaned her blade, the crowd gathered nearby were astonished to see that not even an Itoryu master could best her, getting sick of seeing her fight and noticing her distraught face. It started five years earlier, when the girl told her father and teacher that she wished to go to war. Enthusiastically declaring that falling nobly in battle amidst a hail of arrows and bullets is an honor for a warrior, and she desired such a death. She wished to go out facing the enemy as it surged forward like a crashing wave, caught in a haphazard slaughter against multiple foes until finally being overcome and slain, her face tearing up with the joy at the prospect. Her father noted that with her prodigious sword skills, she would easily attain success and prestige, but she would have none of it. He asked about her life as a woman, pointing out her beautiful features, which caused Ginko to swiftly draw her katana and slice her own face, declaring she was not a woman, but a samurai. Upon hearing this, her father praised her steadfastness and rose, preparing to duel one final time with her as a final lesson. The girl tearfully bid her father farewell before slaying him. One year later, she was part of the vanguard unit of the Western Army. In battle, they were intended to act as cannon fodder, and she chose to be there, eschewing the use of a spear and hoping for death. At the Battle of Sekigahara, they stood firm as the enemy charged headlong with a deafening roar, suffering countless casualties as they attempted to keep their foe at bay with their spears. Ginko, however, dashed forth in a maddened frenzy, slaying enemy soldiers one after another, while loudly keeping count, causing the terrified men to think her a demon. Drenched in blood, she continued her carnage unabated. No matter how much a single person could do, a single soldier cannot change the greater outcome of a battle. Nonetheless, she continued to cut down the enemy within an inch of her life, striving to lead her army to victory. Amidst the fray, she turned to see a mounted samurai aiming at her with a Tanegashima arquebus. Leaping into action and finding the prospect of falling against a foreign weapon amusing, she enthusiastically charged ahead, but as the matchlock fired, her world went black. She woke up in a field of corpses. The battle was already over, and the bullet fired by the enemy had hit her Hachigane armored headband directly, knocking her out. But as she came to her senses, she saw her lifeless comrades all around her, frantically asking if anyone was still alive and if they had won. The soldiers of the Western Army had fulfilled their duty, fighting to the end until not a single man remained, each receiving a warrior's death. The lone survivor Ginko teared up and smashed her head against the ground in utter frustration, crying alone on the battlefield, as she recalls a conversation with her father. He told her that though death is terrifying to anyone, warriors hold an unwavering resolution that allows them to disregard even that fear and allow them to die fighting, describing the warrior's way of life as an honest, pure beauty like that of a katana. Broken, she lifted the head of one of her fallen comrades and cried at being left behind. Having lost her place to die, a year transpired. Even after peace was established, traveling warriors wandered the country in great numbers looking to improve their skill. One such man wanders the roads boasting of his unparalleled swordsmanship, while a follower carries a pretentious flag behind him. The warrior boasts of having slain 20 opponents, declaring that he has taken to the road to find even stronger men to add to the count, and feeling bored due to being too strong. He suddenly grows tense upon seeing Ginko standing before him in the road, one of her blades drawn. With sad eyes, she sees his banner and deduces that he must be someone strong, stating her desire to fight him by any means and desperately asking him to cut off her head. The roaming warrior wonders if she's gone insane, and when his follower cries out that his sensei would not fight a woman, she declares that she is no woman, but a samurai, hoping to die in battle. The warrior then agrees to end her life, declaring that he won't hold back even against a little girl, and insanely asking if she wants to have a taste of his bisecting blade, causing his follower to blush. The engagement is brief, the boisterous man being mercilessly cut down by the small girl while his follower fled. Disheartened, Ginko drags the man's body off the road and gives him a proper burial, placing a stone upon the mound and praying for his soul in what turns out to be a massive graveyard of her slain opponents. He is the 100th soul she has taken. Back in the town, people talk about the demon swordsman, stating that she is a disgraced warrior from Sekigahara who is now looking for a place to die after fleeing the battlefield. As she staggers past them, the unassuming men note that she should take it easy since she survived stating that she is a real demon when it comes to fighting, outright calling her a monster. The haggard samurai arrives at the reincarnation temple, where a monk tells her that her crime of not dying when one should is sinful indeed. She asks if there is no man left in the world capable of ending her, 
but the monk simply tells her to forget about fighting in such matters, telling her to pray to the Buddha since he shall provide salvation to her blood-stained life. She smiles warily and bowing in prayer, silently addresses Buddha, admitting that she killed countless people she is prepared to burn in hell, and wishes to die fighting intensely to the end like her comrades. She then frantically declares that she does not need salvation but an enemy, and asks that if she truly is a demon, she be sent to a hell overrun with Rakshasa as soon as possible. The Buddha's voice agrees with her request, and suddenly her world goes dark. She then starts hearing the frantic voices of desperate people. And as she regains her vision, she finds herself kneeling in the cobbled streets of a western medieval looking city. As she looks around with perplexity, a fully clad knight tells her to run since there's a raid. She then sees towering monsters, torn bodies, and a dragon menacingly looming over the panicked citizens perched atop a western building. Its deafening roar causes Ginkgo to tremble as she looks around in utter confusion and shock. Ginkgo looks in bewilderment as the towering dragon looks at her from atop the building, recalling her father telling her that dragons were but a fairy tale. Confused, she wonders where she is. Seeing the fleeing people, the metal-clad warriors, the western buildings, and the abnormal enemies fighting them, she wonders in horror if she has truly wandered into a fairy tale. Nonetheless, seeing the monsters crush the knights and devour the innocent people, seeing the carnage, sensing the smell of blood and iron, the wailing roars of anger, and the sounds of the fallen as corpses lay scattered all around, she immediately recognizes that she is in a battle. As the armored knights desperately struggle against the monsters, she excitedly decides to join the fray, wondering who she should follow and who she should slay. She gauges the monstrous army to be far superior, boasting tremendous strength, and that the metal men do not stand a chance against them at that rate. She then hears the cries of a child, turning to see her weeping over the corpse of her father. A monster also takes notice of her, leaving his prey and rushing headlong at her, with the knights being unable to stop it. The monster lunges mindlessly, and opens its mouth filled with the jagged teeth as it prepares to devour the girl, but is instantly sliced into several pieces by Ginkgo, who watches the creature with an expressionless face. Both the knights and monsters look on in surprise at the samurai who asks the crying girl if she's alright, reassuringly patting her head in an attempt to comfort her. The girl flees as several monsters rush towards Ginkgo, who notes that the more she looks at them, the stranger the creatures are, wondering if she may be dreaming. Regardless of that, she smiles and declares that she will cut all the monsters down. Drawing her blade, she dances past the creatures, effortlessly slaying them and calling them weaklings, as they lay in a pile of body parts and weapons. Ginkgo then sees the dragon take flight, recalling that in Japanese legends, those creatures command absolute power, and even the strongest warlords can never hope to subjugate these godlike creatures. She rummages inside her robe, and she smiles with childish glee due to her desire to fight it, pulling out a chain and running after the creature. The battered and shocked soldiers wonder who the samurai was, seeing how she instantly disposed of an army of rank B orcs, and wondering if they have been saved. A soldier notes that the mysterious girl saved them from annihilation, and the others wonder if she could be a hero. The first soldier vehemently denies this, declaring that as a hero maniac, he is aware of all current heroes and had them engrave their signatures onto his armor. The second soldier then notes that the girl ran towards the forest of danger, worried about her safety, but his companion points out that the path she took leads to a dead end by the castle walls, so there should be no problem unless she flew. Unbeknownst to them, Ginkgo had done just that, after snagging the dragon's foot with her chain, and is currently dangling through the skies. The dragon notices the dangling girl, and Ginkgo apologizes and asks to borrow his leg for a while, since she can't fly. She then asks the dragon if it's strong, hoping he could be the one to grant her a warrior's death as her strongest opponent. She then excitedly readies her sword and prepares to battle until she looks down, being able to get a full view of the fantasy kingdom for the first time, tearing up as she notes that compared to Edo, it looks like another world. The dragon then snaps the chain with a swoosh of its tail, and Ginkgo is sent falling down to the forest below. Screaming, the samurai falls through the branches until she lands shaking on the forest floor, surprised that she survived. She is glad that she landed in a forest, but is surprised at how different the place is compared to Edo, seeing words that she never saw in her life as well as strange creatures, yet losing sight of the dragon. She wonders where she is, recalling the request that she made inside the temple, and noting that everything she sees is so abnormal, and it makes her doubt whether it's really real. Pausing, she wonders if the world is not the same as the one she lived in, but another world laughing nervously while attempting to brush off the thought. She is cut short by a scream that seems to come from a child, rushing towards the sound and fearing a child is being attacked, leaving the matter of where she is aside and determined to punish those who abuse the weak. Cursing the demons, she promises to deliver her judgment upon them, 
and draws her sword, looking in disbelief as she sees a tentacled tree attempting to eat what seems to be a child. Noticing her, the tree states that it is busted, causing Ginkgo to cry in horror at the sight of a talking tree with a face. The child asks for her help, and the tree addresses her, stating that she will just become her second meal. Still unwilling to believe what she sees, Ginkgo pinches her cheeks and rubs her eyes in an attempt to wake up, causing the human-eating tree to mock her and tell her that this is not a dream. She will perish there. Looking at the tree, the samurai starts to believe she might be going insane from cutting too many heads. Ginkgo stands ready as she faces the Trent. The monster attempts to strike at her with its tentacles, but she jumps and evades the strike, blocking one with her hand. The Trent then notices how agile she is, realizing she must be trained, and asking if she's a hero that fights for a living. Ginkgo then gauges the monster, noting how annoying it is that it can move its roots like human limbs and attack with them all at once. She finds an opening, however, and while the Trent mocks her, wondering how long she'll be able to dodge, the samurai quickly dashes forth and slices all nearby roots, much to the creature's shock. The now enraged Trent screams at her for doing that, as it is a holy incarnation of nature, promising to massacre her with his true form. It doesn't even get a chance to transform, however, as Ginkgo mercilessly cuts it in half, calling him too straightforward. She recalls that a strike from any direction means imminent death, noting that compared to a real battle with projectiles and weapons falling all over the place, the Trent's attacks were below average. Ginkgo's thoughts are cut short when she hears the child, who screams when she turns to face her. Ginkgo is glad that she's not hurt, though she has some things she would like to ask of her. The child then runs off towards a flower she was holding, shaking it until it blooms once more and tearing up in gratitude after she found the mythical manor rose medicinal flower. She then turns towards the samurai, introducing herself as Miko, and declaring her specialty to be in raising flowers, thanking the warrior for saving her. Ginko introduces herself in turn, declaring her specialty to be cutting people down. Miko then praises her for defeating the Trent, asking if she could be a new hero. The samurai looks at the child with confusion not familiar with the term, and she insists that a hero is a hero, not believing she could possibly be unfamiliar with the term and wondering where she came from. Ginko halts her and promises to clarify that presently, but first tells Miko that she will ask her some questions regarding whether she has heard what she is talking about, asking her to answer truthfully. The girl agrees to answer the questions of her savior, and she begins asking whether she heard of a city that goes by Edo, which she denies. The round of questions continues, each of them ending in a vehement denial. Ginko then asks if she doesn't know anything, but the girl insists that the words that she uses are unfamiliar to her, though she wants to try Dango. After some thought, Ginko concludes that her common sense is of no use there, noting that she is not in Japan. She briefly wonders if she's in a foreign country, having read of them while she was younger. Though she finds some similarities between them and her current location, she concludes that she is not overseas, since the things she has seen there and the out-of-the-ordinary scenery are beyond comprehension. Though she doesn't fully understand it yet, it seems that she has wandered into another world. Hearing this, Miko bursts into laughter, refusing to believe the existence of another world. Ginko insists with her explanation, gesticulating wildly, and the girl then asks her how they can converse if that's the case. Unamused, the enraged samurai tells Miko that she can speak Japanese, but she counters by stating that she is currently speaking the language of that world, noting it would be weird if she came from another world and she doesn't even know what Japanese is. Nearing a breakdown, Ginko weirdly states that it must be a weird trick, before asking what kind of thing the Trent is. Miko then tells her about demons, explaining that she just defeated a creature called a Trent, and that the world has many monsters like that one. They're violent, cold-blooded, and attack livestock, towns, and humans, causing disasters as they wreak havoc among mankind, including turning a city to ash. Ginko believes it impossible that a whole capital was turned to ash, but Miko tells her that a hundred thousand people were slaughtered in a single night. Ginko's heart begins to pound loudly, relishing at the thought of the existence of such powerful creatures. Fearing she scared her, the girl reassures her, stating that humans can also fight against the demons with heroes, describing them as humanity's strongest warriors that possess the power to fight demons, with Ginko blushing at the thought. Back at the city, the warriors regroup, and some nuns use magic to heal the wounded, when someone asks if it's already over, demanding her reward. The two soldiers then bow and apologize to the mage named Grunica, fire hero and eighth of the round table, begging for her forgiveness. The mage spits her chewing gum in disgust, demanding one of the men to pick it up and eat it since there is still some sweetness left, and the terrified man immediately complies while inwardly noting her anger. Seeing the pile of chopped up orcs, Grunica then asks what happened. The soldier then tells her of Ginko's intervention, noting her strength. Chewing a new piece of gum now, the mage ponders on how someone defeated an army of orcs without magic, asking where she might be. 
The men don't know, but do note that she doesn't seem to be a hero. And when Grunica moves to leave, she denies knowing anything either, stating that she is only interested in money. Without turning, she asks them how they plan on dealing with the pile of dead orcs. And as they ponder their options, she uses her power to violently set the pile ablaze, furious that someone stole her prey, and wondering who she might be. Meanwhile, Ginkgo laughs maniacally, explaining to Miko that she is happy. As a warrior, she has been seeking the strongest foes to no avail, eventually resorting to killing strangers on the road. And after seeking enlightenment in the temple, she was transported to a world plagued with vile monsters. Regardless of whether she is superior or inferior against the monsters and heroes, she laughs, and declares that the world is full of hope that has yet to be seen, eager to fight as soon as possible. Miko sees this, noting that Ginkgo is indeed… weird. The scary girl then asks her where she could find the heroes, but instead the child offers to bring her home, stating that she wishes to thank her for saving her and asking if she's hungry. The samurai's face brightens up at the thought of food, revealing that she's been starving ever since she arrived. She merrily sets off, but Miko warns her that it's dangerous to walk out of the forest, and she's going the wrong direction. Puzzled, Ginko wonders how they will leave if they don't walk, but the girl just laughs and tells her to get close to her. As the samurai places her hands on her shoulders, Miko tries to concentrate. Ginko believes she's playing a prank on her, stating that whatever may happen will not surprise her anymore, until Miko activates Warp Flower, instantly teleporting them to a flowery meadow outside of the forest and close to a castle. The samurai's face contorts with disbelief, unable to process how she appeared there. Miko explains that she used Floromancy, and thus Ginko finally learns of magic. Arriving at a village, Ginko admits her surprise, noting that Miko is capable of sorcery, while the girl expresses her surprise that she was unaware of the existence of magic. She tells the samurai that they rarely get visitors, and the sensei will be surprised, explaining that she is a kind person who has always taken care of her and runs a charity house, having left her hometown to become a sister. She founded the House of Love Orphanage to care for those who lost their parents to monsters regardless of race, and has been taking care of orphans like her for over 60 years. The samurai is marveled at this, believing this person must be a Buddha-like grandmother, and Miko merrily leads her to the orphanage. Once there, Ginko enthusiastically knocks on the door. Receiving no answer, they wonder if she's away. And just as the disillusioned samurai laments being unable to greet this person, she is suddenly knocked on the back of the head by an enraged nun telling her to get away from Miko. Ginko dodges as the nun thrusts her spear at her, and the nun readies her weapon demanding to know who she is, and noting she reeks of blood, wishing to know her business with Miko. Threatened, Ginko prepares to fight the newcomer, but a frantic Miko intercedes before it comes to blows. With the issue settled, the nun laughs the whole matter off, nonchalantly noting that she was about to kill the samurai, much to the latter's frustration. Wondering what is wrong with the woman, Ginko asks about the benevolent sister, upon which she merrily reveals that she is the one she's looking for, much to the samurai's shock. The nun then grasps her chest and falls to the ground, coughing violently. Both girls are concerned by this, and Miko tells the samurai to take the nun inside. Once in her bed, she sips some awful tasting tea and tries to reassure them, stating that she's fine, and though she's been ill for about half a year, she will not succumb to it. Ginko regrets almost beheading a sick person, but the nun retorts that she would have easily slain the samurai if she were in her prime, much to the latter's delight and Miko's horror. As the nun notices the strange taste of the tea, the floral mage tells her that she got her hands on a mana rose. The nun then furiously lashes out at the girl for breaking her promise of staying clear of the forest of danger, asking if she ran into any danger there. The girl tries to lie, but Ginko innocently recalls that she was almost eaten by a trend, causing the nun to become even more enraged. Miko tells her that she just wanted her to get better, and though it initially seems like the nun will hit her, she embraces her in tears, stating that her best medicine is her, and she's glad she's alright. The surprised Miko then apologizes to her as they share a teary embrace, and Ginko looks from afar and notes that she really is a bodhisattva. Grinning, the nun then introduces herself once more as the sister of the Hisui religion, and director of the House of Love, Gibriel, stating her nickname to be Luchan. Ginko introduces herself in turn, and Gibriel embraces her as Miko's and, by extension, her benefactor, offering her all the food she wants in gratitude. The samurai happily devours these strange dishes, delighted at tasting an isekai meal, and asking if they don't have miso soup. The samurai then asks Gibriel about how long she's been taking care of the orphans, and she confirms that she's been doing it for about 62 years, having raised hundreds of children. Ginko considers it upstanding, but Luchan chugs her beer and tells her that she's no saint. She does it for her self-satisfaction. She then narrates her story, explaining that on one occasion, some demons offed some parents and left the children alone. 
She succeeded in slaying the demon parading it through the street, until she noticed the children. The villagers pitied them but eventually decided to leave them to their fate. Saddened, she embraced them and declared that she would be their parent. Though she insists that she does this for self-satisfaction, neither Ginko nor Miko believe her, and sensing the latter laughing, the nun smacks her some. The samurai then notes that she doesn't look like she's 60, and Gabriel brushes off her cowl to reveal her pointed ears, and when Ginko fails to realize what they mean, she proudly states that she's an elf, and a young one at that. According to the humanoid encyclopedia, the elven race is gifted with longevity and a beautiful complexion, usually living in the holy forest far from other races. Ginko is amazed at the creatures, but the annoyed Gibriel points out that elves aren't that rare. Seeing the confusion, Miko rushes to explain the situation. The elf has a hard time understanding Ginko's origins, but the girl insists that she crossed over from a world of samurai. Gibriel continues to tease her, but Miko insists that it's true. Pondering on the subject, the nun laughs and notes how weird the samurai is. She then declares that she is heading off to town, stating that she is completely cured and thanking Miko for her help, expressing her joy at getting to be her parent. Ginko then walks down the hallway, having eaten her fill of delicious and new isekai food, and determined to pay her respects to Luchan once she returns. She then looks at yet another weird creature, noting that the world is delightful, but she can't get used to the culture of wearing shoes indoors. Her introspection is cut short when she hears Gabriel coughing, finding her kneeling on the floor and coughing up blood. The samurai is alarmed by this, and disregarding the elf's attempts to reassure her, attempts to summon Miko. Gabriel stops her, however, asking her not to tell her anything since she risked her life to get her medicine, and she is not about to drag her kindness through the mud like that. Ginko notes that the flower was supposed to be a cure-all, but the elf tells her that it only works against illnesses. Half a year earlier, she went to a cave known as the Snake Hole to exterminate a dangerous demon, but was defeated. She then removes her robe and reveals she has been cursed, her body slowly turning into stone starting from a hole in her back. She grins, noting that she ended up in that state once half her organs failed, and how pathetic that is for her. Ginko still struggles with the idea of an enemy capable of turning creatures to stone, and the nun explains that it is a dangerous and powerful demon called the Serpent King Basilisk, that can defeat weaker enemies with ease. Ginko trembles at the thought of meeting such a strong foe, and the nun continues to tell her that she sealed the creature in the cave, and does not want Miko to know about the curse since she can't fix it, and kids need to live happily without the concerns of adults. The samurai then asks her what she plans to do about her curse, but Gabriel simply explains that once the caster dies, it will be lifted, and she plans to hold on until the sealed basilisk starves in the cave. Merrily, Ginko declares that she will solve the issue by slaying the snake, disregarding the angry elf's warnings, stating that a samurai never abandons a person in need. She plans to repay her for the meal. She starts to head off, and when Gabriel points out that she doesn't know the way, she asks to borrow her roof immediately climbing up to the bell tower and screening the horizon. Seeing a three-headed mountain, she feels an ominous air coming from it and smells a battle, joyfully running down the road. The elf wonders how she deduced the basilisk's location and what a samurai is, coughing as the girl runs away. Miko then returns from her flower garden with valuable flowers, noting it's been a nice day and planning to gift the villagers. She then notices Gabriel running off with her spear, and the elf tells her to stay put until she returns, as she rushes off after Ginko at full speed. As she runs, she recalls how she took the villager's request to slay the basilisk, believing she could handle it, noting that the basilisk is not normal. She notices a snake-tailed bird called a cockatrice emerging from the brush, easily dispatching it without slowing her pace. She worries about Ginko, but as she arrives at the cave entrance, she sees the gate cut open, and the samurai standing proudly before her with the three basilisk heads piled behind her. She asks the dumbfounded nun if the creature was the basilisk, noting it was powerful and that it had three heads, noting that the odd number was expected in the world. The samurai then explains that she defeated all three heads, since she didn't know which was the one that cursed Luchan, asking her how her stomach feels. The elf lifts her robe to confirm it's healing. Inside the cave, the lesser monsters rejoice at the death of their former dungeon boss, and note how scary Ginko was. That night, Ginko and Gabriel get wasted while refusing to tell Miko where they went, causing the girl to nervously note that they're getting along really well. Once upon a time, the Demon King ruled the world in a dark age. One day, a young man slew the Demon King, ending his rule, and the grateful people gathered around him and built what became the human capital. Its name has been sung around the world for hundreds of years, Avalon. Gabriel, Ginko, and Miko approach the city, and the samurai gazes at its massive size from a distance. Inside, civilians cower as flying imps soar above them, 
The monsters relish at the thought of pranking and harming the defenseless humans below, but as one of them plunges to attack it is struck right in the head by an exploding axe, falling lifeless before his comrades. Wielding the weapon, Boris, the hero of the exploding axe, stares down the fiends, as humans cheer for him. The dwarf measures up his adversaries who managed to sneak in when the barriers were down, and hopes it was just a coincidence. Facing the monsters, he challenges them, before wildly swinging his weapon, promising them a taste of his axe. Elsewhere, Ginko is marveled by the crowded streets. Gabriel explains that Arthur, the hero who defeated the Demon King long ago, along with his descendants, are the kings of the country, with the hero being considered to be above all beings. With his rule, the city became a gathering spot for people and culture. The elf merrily asks the samurai if she finds the place hot, and the latter notes that Edo was quieter. Miko then asks why Lu Chan suddenly insisted on going to the capital, and interrupted her as she was besting Ginko in a game of shogi, and the elf notes that she is also good at chess. She then explains that having recovered, she felt like mixing with the crowd, and also did it for them so they would leave the village, being especially glad that Ginko came, much to the latter's confusion. Seeing a book merchant, Hiko tells the party to wait and approaches the man. The man is reading a Hisui Bible. Seeing Miko, he believes her to be a potential customer and believes she may want a picture book, offering his wares to her. She quietly tells him that she's looking for magic books, specifically a book by Marin Anbron, but the vendor angrily denies having magic books, declaring he only sells healthy books. Scared, he asks her if she doesn't know the laws, and tells her to leave. The girl apologizes, recalling magic books are forbidden, but before she could finish her sentence, the man states that even if he had such books, they would cost 20 gold. Happily, she declares that won't be a problem, and hands him the remaining half of the mana rose, hoping to trade the valuable item for something, before sighing and turning to leave. Before she can, the merchant seizes the business opportunity, handing her the book she was searching for. Back with the group, she shows them the battle magic book, and explains that she guessed the merchant had some illegal items since he was far too well dressed for the owner of a small bookstore. The mage explains that it is a grimoire that teaches magic, revealing her dream to become a hero, for which she would need a lot of magic. Ginko recalls her use of teleportation, and the girl happily hugs her new book. Their attention turns towards a small girl with an oversized helmet trying to buy a sword from an arms vendor. He turns her down, stating that she is penniless and can't even swing a sword with her weak arms, telling her to go home. She insists, stating she can't become a hero without a weapon, but her pleas fall on deaf ears. As she sobs, Miko approaches her and reveals she heard her conversation. The small girl tells her that her father was killed when she was younger, and since then she has strived to become a hero and get her revenge. Gabriel is enraged at seeing her suffer, and as the child begins to cry, the surprised Miko encourages her to not give up, stating a sword isn't the only way to become stronger. She then enthusiastically promotes magic and all the wonderful things one can do with it, exemplifying it with some copyright-friendly individuals and telling her that a mage managed to burn down a huge dragon. The small girl's enthusiasm is soon replaced by the bleak realization that she can't be a mage. To do so, she would need to go to a magic academy to receive formal training, but she and her mother can't afford that. As the girl continues to sob, Miko hands her the grimoire, and explains it will allow her to learn magic without attending an academy, warning her to train hard and not go fighting demons just yet. The grateful girl embraces her new book and promises to become a strong mage, thanking the girl wholeheartedly. Seeing the exchange from afar, Gabriel cries at seeing the girl's kindness, and Ginko recalls that Japan also had sorcerers. The elf huffs, recalling that magic used to be available for everyone until the greedy magic association monopolized it. Walking down the peaceful streets, Ginko notes that the city seems to be important for the people, and compared to the town where she saw the dragon and the forest of danger, there is little smell of blood. According to what Miko said, the demons are the natural enemy of mankind, so there should be no chance of them forcing their way into Avalon, understanding why the people would treat their heroes as kings. She sees the carefree citizens go about their everyday lives, noting that there's no place for her in a peaceful city like this. For the sake of fighting and dying as a samurai, she cut down hundreds of adversaries, and they all perished with a smile on their face as she sent them off. One expressed his gratitude for being granted a warrior's death, telling her not to cry and promising that her day to die in battle will arrive as well. There is no death in Avalon, no honor to be gained, and no battle. Angry, she begins to tell Luchan of her desire to leave, when their conversation is cut short by the cries of fleeing citizens, stating that demons are about to off a hero. They then see a group of mischievous gremlins, with one of them pinning Boris beneath his clawed foot. The dwarf curses his luck, having been overwhelmed by the hordes of weak demons. As Gabriel prepares to fight, the gremlins state that Boris has slain five of their kind, and they will end everyone in the streets as payback, grinning as they see the three remaining humans. Their leader tells the group not to move, Elsie ends the dwarf's life, and the latter tells them to run. Miko asks Gabriel what to do, fearing for the hero's safety, 
and the demon begins to think on how to torture them. Ginkgo then shifts, happily reaching for her sword. The demon leader is surprised to see her slowly walking toward him, repeating his earlier threat before the samurai cuts him short, stating that he can end the dwarf, since he should die after being captured instead of facing the humiliation. She then smashes the gremlin's face with the butt of her katana, and grabs the creature by its arm, violently swinging the monster and causing it to smash against its comrades before sending it crashing against other monsters. A short while later, all the gremlins lie in a bloody pile, having been cut to shreds by Ginkgo, much to Boris's surprise. Miko wishes she was as strong as the samurai, recalling how she defeated a Trent when they met in the forest, and noting she is way too strong. And she wonders what a samurai truly is. Meanwhile, Ginkgo closes a creature's mouth and eyes and prays over its remains. Having cleared the street, she notes that even in a city as peaceful as that one, there would still be battles that could easily claim lives. She relishes at this, licking her bloody fingers as she declares that in order to live as a samurai, one must also die as a samurai. Glad that the place is worthy to be called Hell. Gabriel then addresses the dwarven hero, noting his arms look pretty banged up. Looking at her from up close, he recognizes her as the former spear hero, Gabriel Lu, having seen her earlier and asking who the girl may be and if she's with her. The nun then tells him that she doesn't know much herself, save that she said she hailed from another world. The dwarf doesn't understand this, but notes that she saved him, but also reeks of blood. This means that unlike heroes like him and Gabriel who only hunt monsters, she has hunted humans, and the stench of blood has even seeped deep within her bones. The elf states that she is aware of this, and Boris points out that nobles and the king reside in the city, wondering if they can trust in Ginkgo. Inwardly, Gabriel recalls how the samurai saved her and the good moments that they shared together. Nonetheless, she states that she does not trust her. She then tells the confused dwarf that she is not necessarily in existence that invites disasters, but possesses a strength that cannot be ignored, so she wants to be sure of whether she is a human or a demon. Boris asks what her plan is, and the elf tells him that she will take her to the Hero's Guild, stating that if Gin is just a killer or an enemy of humanity, she will be ended on the spot. The girl that was given the magic book saw the whole fight from a distance, having followed the group wishing to thank them once more. She admires Ginkgo, having seen her power firsthand, and notes that maybe swords are better than magic after all. Boris looks at the neatly arranged row of slain goblins and humphs, being teased by Gabriel for losing to the creatures. The dwarf angrily replies, noting that her arrogant side has not changed, and his fighting style is one-on-one. -on -one. He then asks Ginkgo her name, and the samurai proudly introduces herself. The dwarf then introduces himself in turn, and thanks her for saving his life, but she just laughs it off, stating that she did whatever she wanted after seeing the monsters, noting that they were kind of weak. Hearing this, Boris takes note that helping him wasn't her goal, calling her quite the snappy girl before turning to Miko, noting how polite she is compared to the rude elf taking care of her, with the young mage being inwardly relieved that Boris survived and she got to talk to him. Ginko expresses her surprise at seeing him hold the huge axe with his small frame, to which Boris replies that the axe feels light and he is a dwarf. According to the human encyclopedia, these beings have incredible strength that contradicts their size, having a long lifespan and an ever-present beard. Ginko then realizes that Boris is not a normal human, and Gabriel sits down while explaining that dwarves are a disliked race, being stubborn and heavy eaters and drinkers, but have a perk that no one can compete with since they can make weapons. Their ability to make weapons and detailed tools is unparalleled, with them being responsible for producing 90% of all weapons in the world, as well as buildings and clothes. She describes the proud race as the backbone of civilization. Emboldened, the dwarf lists several legendary weapons his race has crafted while pounding his chest with pride and the enthusiastic Ginko asks him if they can make a katana. Miko then asks Gabriel if she knows Boris, and she reveals that they used to be buddies when she was a hero, having joined the guild at the same time decades ago and laughing about it. Getting serious, Boris studies the unassuming samurai and notes that despite reeking of death, she doesn't look evil. He asks himself if killing humans is a common occurrence for her, wondering how messed up her world is for her to become that crazy. Pulling Gabriel aside, he asks her what she plans on doing when she brings her to the guild to determine if she's human and she replies that she plans to have her meet the Hero of Law. A hero is one that moves forward with courage to help the weak and purge evil, possessing both strength and an elegant spirit. For that reason, the Hero's Guild assesses whether someone can be a hero to ensure that they have a good heart, and the Hero of Law is entrusted with that task. Boris realizes his insight could judge Ginkgo's worth, but believes the plan to be dumb if even someone like Grunika got approved. As they argue, Ginkgo stealthily approaches them from behind with an eerie smile, scaring them senseless. She apologizes for that, before asking the elf if monsters revive when they die, pointing to the bloodstains where the two gremlins used to lie. 
The samurai explains that she wished to line up the corpses out of respect, but two of them vanished before she realized. Alarmed, Gabriel and Boris inspect the scene, while Genko wonders if she is not skilled enough, and Miko explains that gremlins are mischievous and have a strong life force. Boris doesn't believe that could mean they could survive being cut in half, but the elf points out they're still alive and at large in the city, telling everyone to split up and search for them before anyone else dies. Meanwhile, the two remaining gremlins speak softly to each other, biding their time to escape. They have survived thanks to a witch's magic, being able to survive a cut. They wonder about the pose they were placed in, but decide to wait until the heroes leave to terrorize the population once more. Boris and Gabriel prepare to scan the eastern quarters of the city, while Ginkgo deals with the west, and the samurai is surprised at seeing an enemy still alive with their torsos cut, joyfully declaring that she can never have enough of the weird enemies she's been meeting. Lu Chan tells Miko to stay put, and hide in a building since gremlins are still demons, before heading towards her search area. But as the two remaining gremlins grin, both her and Boris turn and draw their weapons. Before they can land a single blow, Ginko reaches the monsters ahead of them, chopping them to bits as the astounded heroes look on. The samurai enthusiastically asks if she just has to cut the monsters to pieces when a single cut isn't enough, which the shocked heroes confirm while Miko looks on in horror. While Gabriel and Boris search the east, Ginko remains in the square and inspects her swords, which she picked up at Sekigahara and named arbitrarily. Sheathing her blade, she moves to head east. She is stopped by Miko who asks to join her. The samurai bluntly refuses, stating that this is a samurai's battle between her and the gremlin, and she won't hold back, planning to continue until either of them loses their lives. She also recalls Lu Chan menacingly telling Miko to not do anything unnecessary or come into danger. Though the scared girl admits she might not be reliable, she declares that she is aware of how terrifying demons can be, as she has lost her parents to them. But precisely for that reason, she can't always be running away from demons and wishes to fight. She asks Ginko for a reply, and the samurai recalls trying to join the Japanese invasion of Korea when she was younger, arming herself to the teeth only for her father to turn her down, stating that bringing a greenhorn to the battlefield would only disrespect both enemy and ally. She remembers those times fondly, noting that there was a time when she was reckless as well, and she agrees to allow Miko to do as she wants, much to the latter's delight. Elsewhere, a gremlin attempts to fly away and struggles due to its wounds, promising revenge on Ginko for inflicting them. He then plans to have a witch make the strongest demon, noting that they will need many corpses for that, and promising to return with Behemoth and the troll army the next time, while letting out an evil laugh. Miko detects the creature, having followed the trail of bloodstains, and as Ginko muses on how to attack it, the mage throws some seeds and uses her floromancy skills to fire them as sunflower bullets at the creature. Though wounded, the gremlin remains airborne and turns menacingly at his attacker, its face turning to sheer terror once he sees Ginko there. As the creature flees, the samurai praises Miko's magic, later thinking on how to bring down the gremlin. Noticing a weapons shop, she approaches the terrified vendor and asks to borrow a bow and arrow. The man gives her a massive bow and arrow, and Ginko proudly tells Miko that she is a master of all weapons, stating that she especially likes the bow since she admires Nasu no Yoichi, a renowned general from the Heian period. Miko tries to draw the bow in vain, asking the vendor for a lighter bow, but the man notes that all his products are about power, noting that the bow is designed for beastmen or dragons and even he couldn't pull it. He then tells them to do something about the demon. Ginko slowly removes her katanas and hands them to Miko, before removing the left side of her kimono, lifting the bow and arrow. The surprised mage notes that it's impossible to draw the bow, but the samurai remains undaunted. The wakyu bows that Japanese warriors have used since the old days have the greatest draw weight of any great bow in the world, with a force capable of piercing shields and armor to tear the enemy's bodies to nothing. Wearing heavy armor, those warriors stormed the battlefield armed with bows and spears. Their arm length changed due to the grueling days of training they endured to achieve their Herculean strength. Fully focused, Ginko draws the bow with ease. Seeing her target flee, she wonders why it would run since perishing after giving everything would be the most honorable death of all, eerily asking the creature to fight her before releasing the arrow. The projectile reaches the gremlin just as it turns, tearing it asunder and causing it to explode. Though Miko and the weapons vendor cheer her on, the samurai's face is marked by the regret of not meeting a worthy opponent, only changing as Miko hugs her and praises her for the shot. Meanwhile, the arrow continues its trajectory. In its path, Grunica floats while angrily complaining about receiving only 30 gold pieces for protecting a village. Before she can finish her rant, the arrow passes right through her skull, causing her to fall lifeless to the ground as the terrified girls look on. Two days before reaching the royal capital of Avalon, Ginko and co. traveled the road. Gabriel became distressed after Miko got a small cut, after being attacked by a werewolf before the elf could dispatch it. Ginko was fascinated by the kobold, 
noting to herself that the world was indeed full of monsters she wasn't aware of, wondering how Buddha was aware of a world like that. Her introspection was cut short by the ruckus of Luchan's overreaction. The concerned elf then told the girl to not move, disregarding her advice about saving mana for future emergencies. Concentrating, she used heal magic to make the wound regenerate instantly, surprising the samurai. Miko explained to Ginko that heal magic heightens the regeneration, and heals their wound in a split second, being the first thing one learns in a magic academy, and easy enough for anyone to learn, much to the samurai's surprise. Suddenly, Gibriel collapsed, having drained all of her mana, and Miko explained that even in her best condition, she can only use heal two times. As the elf felt sick and barfed, Ginko asked Miko if she could just use heal on her, but the mage explained it wouldn't work, since Luchan was experiencing mana exhaustion, and would recover as long as she rested for a while. Furthermore, she told her that sharing her mana would not work, since their mana types are not the same. Ginko then noted that such spells would have been really useful in battles she fought in Japan, enthusiastically asking if it could be used to regrow limbs or revive someone. Miko explained that heal only strengthened regeneration, and could not grow back missing flesh. The magic for that was called Regrow, and it took 10 times more mana than Heal, and can't be cast if you don't have enough. She also told her about Revive, warning that such magic is privy only to the gods, and though many mages have attempted to use it, they only achieved a Theory, experiencing mana depletion and dying in the attempt. Miko then adamantly stated that the dead could not be revived, and with the conversation being over, they began to search for a place to stay. Back in the present, Ginko and Miko stare at the bloody mess that used to be Grunika's head, with shock and disgust. The frightened mage covers her face while stating that she should explain this to the court of law, defending the samurai, affirming that the fire mage was just unlucky, and promising to testify in her favor. The samurai, however, pays no heed to her, and falls to the ground with a livid face. She then recalls her father teaching her that a samurai must always be righteous and fair, and only cut those down ready to put their lives on the line and do no harm to anyone else otherwise. Ginko embraces this teaching, but having a realization asks how a samurai should take responsibility for accidentally ending an innocent bystander. Her father bluntly declares that the samurai must kill himself immediately to make amends. Taking those teachings to heart, Ginko opens her robe and prepares to commit seppuku, lamenting that she has failed to die in a battle, and entrusting Miko with beheading her, explaining to the terrified mage that she will cut her own gut and then be beheaded, as befitting a samurai. Her attempt to off herself comes to an end when Grunika rises from the ground, rubbing her head and wondering what just happened, noting that she almost died while chewing some gum. The girls are shocked to see her alive, and the prepotent mage tells them to kneel down in her presence, while noting that an arrow hit her. Ginko takes responsibility for this and apologizes, so Grunika attempts to punch her with all her might, surprised to see the samurai dodge the strike. As she chastises Ginko for her carelessness, Miko tries to make sense of what just happened, firmly believing that the mage died and came back. She then tries to intercede in her friend's favor, but the samurai insists on handling it herself, stating that excuses are useless, but a samurai must not leave loose ends before they die, with the fire mage agreeing with greedy eyes. Ginko states that she had hoped to force the demon to attack her, but instead only turns the city into a battlefield, having lost her pride as a samurai after looking for an enemy too hard. Miko once again tries to intercede, but the fire mage greedily demands some sincerity from the samurai, asking what she is willing to do for her and stating that an apology will not solve things. Ginko agrees with her, stating that those who lie shall be whipped, and those who steal will lose their fingers, slipping her robe and unsheathing her sword. Grunika's greedy smile immediately turns to shock when Ginko slices her left arm off in one clean cut, biting her severed hand to stifle any shriek, while the others scream in horror. Undaunted, the samurai presents her limp arm to the fire mage as the price to pay for being immature, asking to be allowed to resolve the incident with her arm. Furious and shocked, Grunika yells at her asking if she's mentally disabled, stating that she wanted money, and that was what people meant when they demanded sincerity, asking why she would hack off her arm as the samurai continues to bleed out. Miko cries as she asks her friend what she's doing, wondering how she could cut her own arm off, hoping she would choose an option to settle things that didn't involve cutting herself. Face palming, Grunika approaches the samurai and tells her that she killed her mood just when she thought that she was getting some compensation. Snatching her severed arm from her, the fire mage tells her to not move, and uses regrow magic to reattach her limb. Miko is surprised at this, noting that while normally reattached limbs can't move and the wounds should not disappear, Ginko can freely move her arm and the skin is smooth. The fire mage states that those things happen when an amateur does it, stating that her magic is perfect, and warning her to not move the arm too much until her mana stabilizes and not to go fighting any demons charging her 300 gold as she turns to leave. Ginko tells her to wait, falling to her knees, 
and introduces herself as a samurai from another world searching for the strongest fighters. Enthusiastically admiring her sorcery skills, believing that she must be an extraordinary combatant as well, she asks her to have a fight, but is saddened to see Grunica ignore them without even looking back. Meanwhile, in a village to the west of Avalon and within sight of the city, carnage ensues, as its human defenders are bested by a lizard man. The creature yells at them for being too weak, asking for a human who can entertain him, as he continues to slaughter the human soldiers. He's about to strike another soldier down when a bright light flashes before him. Turning around, the monster sees two newcomers, a man wearing a judge's robes, and a second man in a suit holding a sorcery book and a wand who is responsible for the bright flash. The lizard man demands to know who they are, and as the human soldiers flee, the judge tells the monster that they received intel that a ferocious demon had attacked the village, taking note of its evil face and the evil intentions it gives off, assuming that he is rotten even among the nature of demons. The enraged demon slashes at him with its sword, but the old man swiftly jumps and dodges the strike, summoning a massive wooden hammer and hitting the lizard man square in the center of its head, rendering it unconscious. The monster comes back to its senses only to find itself chained up to a tree stump, and demands to know what the human plans to do. While his second checks on nearby men, the judge declares that he will ask some questions and lay judgment upon him for his sins, stating that he is a jury of sorts. Starting the interrogation, he demands to know if it's the first village he attacked, but the monster refuses to give any information whatsoever. Seeing this, the judge uses his law magic, and a ball of mana begins to glow in the palm of his hand. The mana then takes the shape of a miniature smiling judge, gavel included, and when the surprised monster asks about this new being, the judge states that it's a mana doll made with his mana called Judge. He then reveals that Judge can see everything, including the accused's history, thoughts, kindnesses, sins, and crimes, and can lay down sentences without any sentiment and befalling judgment. The mana doll then inspects the nervous lizard man with intent, its eyes sparkling with realization once its assessment is complete. Judge then quotes him as having stated that he loved hearing human screams, before proceeding to reveal that his first crime was committed when he was nine years old, having offed a traveler and his friends for trespassing his turf, and having tasted the fun of hunting humans, he began to attack them more frequently. The Manadol then states that the lizard man remembered the screams of his stronger victims as they were tortured in his lair, declaring that he has killed 20 people, utterly shocking the creature. The judge's aide then pulls a beast man from the rucksack the lizard man was carrying, who turns out to be the battered Katiro Matatabi. The terrified monster attempts to explain it off, but Judge lists his many crimes, citing destruction of property, unjust violence towards civilians, and assaulting a hero who is protecting the people. The doll declares him to be an evil, psychotic murderer, denying any chance for an appeal and sentencing the monster to death according to the laws of the land. The judge immediately carries out the sentence, smashing the monster with his giant hammer. With the matter settled, the judge notes that he had hoped to get some info on a witch but instead found a small fry who liked ending humans. His aide states that lizard men are no small fry, being danger rank A along with basilisks and trolls, and then heads off to help the injured. Alone, the judge states that his law magic can see one's kindness and sins, and the people deemed evil by judge, whether they be demons or humans, have no option other than death. He is Dracro, the hero of law. Meanwhile, back in Avalon, Boris and Gibriel finish smoking out a gremlin hiding in a cardboard box and the elf suggests that they bring Ginko to the Heroes Guild already. Sometime earlier back at the House of Love Orphanage, Miko admires Ginko's katana, noticing its immaculate polish and sharp edge. The samurai proudly describes it as a samurai's soul, explaining that the shorter wakizashi is used as a backup for the main sword or for indoor combat. She then asks why Gabriel always goes to sleep the moment she is done with dinner, to which Miko replies that elves are early birds. Staring at the blade, the mage notes that Ginko's world has no monsters such as slimes, goblins, zombies, or kobolds, wondering why there would be numerous samurais like her in such a heavenly world. She cannot understand what they would be fighting that required them to train so hard and make deadly weapons. But Ginko replies as if it was an obvious fact that they fought other humans. Miko laughs at this, believing it to be a joke, and finding it inconceivable for people to fight each other in a world without monsters. Unbeknownst to the girls, Gabriel was wide awake and intently listening in on their conversation with her superb elven hearing. Back in the present, Ginko is still feeling disappointed after being denied the chance to fight Grunika, while Miko points out that she was really a powerful and scary mage, and she could not just pick a fight with her, being glad that she ignored her. Still sad, Ginko states that it is an honor to challenge the strong, and she believed she had to ask her for a duel, calling herself a sad excuse for a samurai for failing at this. Inwardly, Miko remarks that Ginko is usually a kind and sincere person, 
but when she goes full samurai, she becomes strange or outright scary. She brushes off the memory of that terrifying facet of hers, repeating to herself that the samurai saved her life and thus, she cannot doubt her, repeating to herself that she is a good person. They both turn as they hear some children doing some ruckus and wielding some household tools while yelling incoherently. They approach them, and the children state that having heard that there were big, scary monsters flying around, they decided to protect the streets and fight them. Ginko praises them, calling them brave and noting their readiness to die for their cause. And when they hear that last part, she bluntly states that children will inevitably die if they fight. She then proceeds to give them a gruesome description of what will happen if they fight, including bleeding, broken bones, and eviscerations brutal enough to break even the strongest boy. Ginko then laughs like a maniac, as the children scream in terror, before returning to her kind self and telling them to leave the repelling to her and return home, smiling as she notes that their families must be worried. Miko smiles as she realizes what Ginko just did, and as the samurai reassures the children stating that she's a strong samurai that can cut through anything, the mage notes to herself that she is indeed a kind person. Dracro then walks past her with his arms behind his back, as he confirms that facing evil is a hero's job, that being the law way before the universe was even created. Ginko then notices the elderly man approaching with a solemn and tired face, and the children joyfully greet him and ask to play hide and seek with the hero. He asks them about their studies and after they state they've already finished that, promises to play with them the next day. As the children go merrily on their way, Miko recognizes Dracro as the hero of law. As the man confirms his identity, she explains to Ginko that he is a strict and just person who judges people and fights monsters. He is a genius in combat and sees people's sins with his law magic, and has been judging evil ever since he was young, which has earned him his moniker of the hero of law. She describes him as a hero to look up to, and Ginko finds him outstanding. The flattered hero then states that he heard that there were demons there, telling them to stay inside until they're defeated. Miko tells him there's no need, since her friend Ginko defeated the gremlins, praising her strength and causing her heart to thump loudly after having made a friend for the first time. The hero thanks her for her help, noting that he had not seen her before and asking if she was a hero and where she came from. Before she can answer, however, he summons Judge, and sends him forth to assess the girl. Ginko finds the man doll cute and mysterious, and a fascinated Miko admits that it's her first time seeing such a magical being. Dracro explains that Judge remembers every law in the country, and has the ability of retrocognition which allows it to scan a person's past. This means that it never misjudges and it never lets evil escape, making the man doll the perfect judge of the law. Ginko then scratches the back of the doll, mishearing correction as scratch. Dracro then tells them about the orc raid on the city of Vidaya a few days earlier, as well as the dragon attack that took place explaining that the soldiers claimed that a weird girl came out of nowhere and saved them. Having their hands full with the demons already, the heroes cannot afford a strange being to roam around freely, and they are now enhancing their search on criminals. He then asks them to cooperate, stating that Judge can sentence anyone in the blink of an eye, and won't harm those who are innocent. Suddenly, Dracro realizes that the Manadol has frozen in place before Genko. Judge shivers in terror and sweats profusely, its face distorted in terror as he sees Ginko's past as a samurai, and the numerous people she slew back in Japan. Terrified, the doll screams in horror and hurries away from the surprised girl, trembling in Dracro's arms as the hero asks him what he saw. After stuttering for a while, Judge screams that Ginko is a murderer, having killed people before, and she smiles as she realizes it can read her memories. The doll continues to state that a human killing another is the biggest taboo of the royal law and the heaviest crime of all, but he cannot sentence her, since she is beyond this world, and thus the law doesn't apply to her. Screaming, he declares her to be a monster from a messed up world known as a samurai, before dropping unconscious. Dracro asks the doll what he meant about not being able to judge her, and asks about the sentence, obtaining no reply from Judge. Nico watches in distress as the hero of law paces around wondering what to do. This is the first time in his life that Judge has given up on a sentence, but he cannot just let a suspicious being walk free. Thinking about how to get out of the pickle, he asks the samurai if she will let him capture her for the time being, and lock her in the smelly, dirty, and mouse-ridden cells. Ginko is shocked by this, furiously asking if he really thinks that there would be anyone dumb enough to enter a prison by themselves, declaring that she had not done anything that she couldn't face her parents with, 
Draco asks if she refuses to go voluntarily, and as the girl confirms it, he sighs at the complicated situation. Seeing that asking won't work, he materializes a sword named Temis out of mana. Raising it, he solemnly demands to know his adversary's name, and Ginkgo promptly introduces herself, glad to be fighting a powerful opponent. Draco and Ginkgo exchange blows at full speed, each parrying the other's moves, in a frenzied clash of steel against steel. Both fully focused in the fight, the hero of law thrusts forward, but the samurai uses her superior agility to dodge and circle around him, dodging a blow by somersaulting to safety and managing to cut Draco's face in the process. Seeing him bleeding, she cries out that those half-hearted attacks cannot kill her, demanding that he fight with all his spirit and strength, as is the rule in a battle. The hero notes inwardly that his opponent is strong, possessing a scarily well-built body with incredible swordsmanship and, above all else, massive amounts of experience fighting humans. He wonders why that would be the case, since in their world, humans have only been punishing evil since the past, and have protected people from violence and death. The only motive of monsters is to kill, and they can't be reasoned with, so humans are constantly threatened by their continued existence. Thus, humanity has a mutual enemy in the demons, and they are all comrades in arms in their struggle against them. Thus, there is no reason nor need for skills to fight against people anymore, with the last war between humans having taken place thousands of years ago. Thus, he wonders why an abnormality such as Ginkgo exists. The two continue to trade blows at breathtaking speeds. Ginkgo smiles as she parries another strike, only to see a fist heading straight towards her head. Instinctively, she grips the arm and softens the blow, maintaining the grip and swiftly severing his hand with her sword, as the judge realizes that he cannot let that being go free. As he looks at his severed stump, Ginkgo smiles, lifting her sword to deliver the killing blow. Before she can strike, Miko stands between her and Draco, and the samurai barely manages to stop her blade before beheading her, causing both combatants to scream at her in surprise. An enraged Ginkgo demands to know what the girl was thinking jumping into a samurai's fight in the midst of battle, stating that she would not be at fault if she had cut her down where she stood. Frantically, Miko grabs the samurai by her arms and declares that she's on her side and trusts her, startling the warrior. She explains that Draco is above hundreds of heroes in that world, being one of the twelve that have a seat at the round table. She goes on to state that he has contributed a lot to the country both as a hero and jury, and has as much power as the royals, so his death would cause chaos even if it was in self-defense. And as such, she had to stop her, apologizing for stopping her battle. Ginkgo pauses and reluctantly accepts what she said, asking if she was hurt. Though Miko replies that she was fine and wasn't hit, Draco notices blood dripping from beneath the girl's dress, sighing in relief. Miko then asks Ginkgo to tell her one thing, being her friend and needing to know if what the Hero of Law said was a lie, unwilling to believe that the samurai would kill people. Puzzled, Ginkgo replies that she did, noting that it's normal for a samurai to kill people. Miko is devastated by her blunt reply, stating that it was awful, and was about to say that she believed in her, expecting something different. Confused by the reaction, she huffs, and reminds her that in her world a human's enemy is a human, and humans have been at each other's throats for thousands of years. Shocked to see she wasn't joking, she doesn't even want to imagine a war between people, and Ginkgo starts to wonder if that's weird. Meanwhile, Draco tears a piece of his robe and winds it up around his stump as a makeshift tourniquet, having heard Ginkgo state that she was from another world. Saddened, Miko admits that she knew that she was not the one who cured Gibriel of her disease, but instead it was Ginkgo that cleansed her curse, having overheard them back at the orphanage. Both of them kept quiet for her sake, and the samurai saved both her and the elf. So Miko believes she is a really strong and kind person, and they're friends, regardless of whether she is good or evil. And so, she wants to know more. Miko asks Ginkgo what a samurai is, and after some thought, the girl states that every samurai's reason to fight varies. Some do it for their country, others for their lords, for their homes, for fame or for money. To sate their savage desires, some would kill innocent people or resort to underhanded tactics. And it does not matter what they do as long as they win. Ginkgo then angrily declares that such a path for a samurai is of no interest to her, not having any big desires nor need for money and fame. She only desires to fight to live and live to fight until she is no more. The heated life of the samurai way is her belief, and samurais should follow their heart. It doesn't matter where she is and she doesn't care what is right or wrong. As the girl looks on in silence, Ginkgo states that she only helped Luchan because she wanted to, and thus the mage doesn't have to be grateful for it. Her speech is cut short when Draco uses his magic to create a magical mana lock around her wrists, noting that she was wide open, and announcing that he has arrested her. The furious samurai tries to brute force the locks open despite the hero's warnings against it. Focusing all of her might, she insists, until the lock starts to groan. 
but her struggle causes her formerly severed arm to start bleeding and she desists, unaware of how close she came to breaking free. Seeing her wound has completely reopened, Miko points out that it happened because she forgot Grunika's warning to not use her arm too much until her mana is stabilized. Defeated, the samurai turns to Drake Road demanding that he deliver the final blow. Standing away apart, he refuses her request, and a bewildered Ginkgo states that living after a loss brings shame, calling beheading your opponent a common courtesy. Unmoved, the Hero of Law asks if that's one of her samurai rules, stating it has nothing to do with him, and that unless she is sentenced to death by the law, he will never kill, gripping his stump as he declares his belief. He then notes that placing one's value on someone else is simply arrogant, asking rhetorically if that's not one of the habits a samurai should not have. Their chat is cut short as Gibriel screams in shock at the scene, having just arrived with Boris. Miko addresses the panting heroes, who sigh upon seeing the wounded Draco, Ginkgo in chains, and Judge passed out on the street. Boris asks what happened, and the elf joins in, but not before furiously scolding Miko for disobeying her command to hide. Draco asks why they're there, telling them not to make the situation any more troubling than it already is. After he fills them in on what transpired there, Boris notes how their plan to have Ginkgo checked by the Hero of Law just happened on its own, stating that dwarves and elves have good noses when it comes to the scent of blood, so they knew that Ginkgo was not a normal girl. Gabriel adds that she also believed her to be bad news when she first saw her, even trying to kill her on sight, but also adds that she is a good and honest kid who saved both her and Miko, with Boris adding that she saved him too and wants to trust her. Meanwhile, Miko uses a healing flower and her floromancy skill to heal Ginko's arm by enhancing the power of the flower. As the samurai marvels at her skill, Dragro tells Gibriel and Boris that he does not plan on executing her for the time being, since a judge could not sentence her. Boris then points out that she cut off his hand, but he merely replies that it happened because he tried to arrest her, and it was his fault for underestimating the girl. However, since she is still dangerous, he has to at least restrict her, and believes the underground prison beneath the Heroes Guild should be enough. Gabriel is relieved that Ginko won't be executed, though the samurai is disillusioned by this development. Raising his hand, the Hero of Law declares that, considering Judge's testimony and hers and adding up all the facts, he has confirmed one thing that, though absurd, will make everything make sense if it's true. As the impatient Luchan tells him to spit it out, Draco concludes that Judge could not sentence a crime as big as murder despite knowing all the laws, because the law only applies to humans from that world. Believing Ginko to be from another world, he tells them that he has someone in mind who might know something about it. While Ginko and Miko examine the heavy cuffs around the samurai's wrists, Draco properly greets Gibriel, who notes his severed stump. As he states that he will have Grunica fix it, the distant mage sneezes as her name is mentioned. Judge leads the group towards the Heroes Guild with Gibriel carrying the cuffed Ginko over her shoulder. The elf asks the samurai if she's okay and when the embarrassed samurai mutters that she can walk on her own, the elf points out that they are in the context of detaining them. Saddened, Ginko wonders what she's doing. A samurai should fight with her all and die, but that would not be working well for her. Buddha brought her to a world where her dreams would come true, or at least he should have, but right now she questions what was on the deity's mind when he brought her there. She asks where they're going, and Draco tells her that they're heading towards the Heroes Guild, with Boris describing it as a gathering spot for heroes. Ginko's eyes brighten up at the prospect of meeting multiple heroes, but the dwarf states that they don't live there, but head there to make reports and gather intel on demons. Dropping the samurai on the ground, Gabriel enthusiastically declares that she will give her a history lesson while they walk. As she explains, a long time ago demons were in control of the world, being led by the demon lord Loki who is their king. With his overwhelming strength, Loki ruled the world, and the only reason he did not kill all humanoids was because they were useful to him as slaves. Ginko snaps at this, calling him immoral, and declaring that she would have killed all humans without a doubt, causing everyone to look at her with perplexity. Gabriel continues, stating that even in a time like that, adventurers and travelers fought against the tide while living their own lives, receiving rewards for fending off demons, exploring new lands or mining dungeons filled with demons. One such adventurer stood for all of humanity. His name was Arthur Pendragon and he feared nothing, not even death. The stronger his enemies were, the more he smiled as he battled them with his sword, and he fought constantly against ever greater odds. His actions struck the hearts of many adventurers and travelers, who then became his companions and aided him in his quest, until he finally was able to defeat the demon army and slay the demon king Loki. Having accomplished such a feat, people named him a hero, the unbeatable warrior with unwavering bravery. The adventurers and travelers who had roamed the land freely were inspired by his bravery, taking up arms to protect the people, and with the Demon King gone, the heroes easily beat up the rest of the demons. 
humanity started to reclaim its lands, and the newly anointed King Arthur said that they are the real heroes. Gibriel concludes her story with a happily ever after, and Boris adds that current heroes were made thus, and since then they continue to defend humans from demons, and have an organization to manage and support them, the Heroes Guild. Ginkgo finds the story exciting and akin to a fairy tale, and Boris realizes that Gibriel took the lines from a picture book, which the elf and Miko confirm. The samurai finds the tale of the journey to cut off a general's head against uncertain odds inspiring. Drakro announces that they have arrived, as they stand before a massive palace-like structure. Ginkgo finds it majestic not having seen such a structure even in Edo, and is excited to enter the edifice. Miko notes that it would be her first time entering such a structure, but nervously states that maybe she shouldn't go in. Dragro then shows her a guild pass known as an Apple Pass, which is used by heroes when asked for identification, stating that even though it is not recommended for a hero to bring outsiders into the guild, it's not forbidden, and a child should be no problem. Gabriel and Boris have gone ahead and urged them to join in, and as the surly Dragro leads the way, Miko nervously starts approaching the building. Ginko then approaches the girl, whispering to her that blade wounds easily leave scars, and reminding her to use heal and take care of it. The girl looks at her in shock, realizing that she was where she nicked her from the beginning, but believed it would be rude to point it out right then. Climbing the stairs, they enter the guild through a pair of glass doors and step into a huge hall. Ginko notes that it is an altogether different construction compared to anything in Japan, but notes that the all-familiar smell will always be everywhere. Before them, in the Great Hall, lies the corpse of a huge fish-like monster.